I'm introducing me. Um, so I'm currently one of the F1s on vascular surgery um, and I've done a medical job first as well. So I've done medical and surgical on calls. And this talk is basically focused around some of the common prescriptions that we um, make during our on calls um, and, you know, the common things we're asked to prescribe on call. Um, so I just wanted to sort of share this presentation with you um, as things that I found helpful um, going through F1. Um, and the other thing is I've based this, um, these cases on questions from the PSA. So I've used the PSA questions as a template to sort of write my own cases. So I'll be talking through some cases through my presentation. So the topics to be covered this evening. So I'm going to talk through anticoagulation, um, analgesia, insulin and antiemetics as the four main areas I'm going to cover. So I th thought I'd start by um, saying that these are two apps that I find really helpful on my day to day, um, in my day to day work. Um, I'd suggest that if you haven't already, if you could download the BNF and MD Calc onto your phones, um, I use them on a daily basis and they're just really good to have to hand um, when you're prescribing on the wards. So without further ado, on to my first case. So. Mr. Smith is a 65 year old man who's had a total hip replacement. Um, he weighs 80 kilograms. He's a type two diabetic. He has hypertension um, CKD and he's not currently anticoagulated. So, oh, sorry. You've been bleeped by the nurses um, because he's been, um, he's developed sudden onset pleuritic chest pain with no hemoptysis. His ECG shows sinus tachycardia at a rate of 100 110 and his obs are otherwise okay. His chest is clear and his heart sounds are normal and he's got no pitting edema but slight swelling of the right leg, mild emetrythema and tenderness and his chest x-ray shows nothing acute. So um, the impression for this patient, so in terms of the history the main things that I would notice about this history are that the fast heart rate um, so sinus tachycardia, you sort of think along the lines of PE. Um, he's had a recent total hip replacement, so that puts him at high risk for a PE. And he's got the sudden onset pleuritic chest pain. So um, these are all sort of, you know, clues as to that like, this man might have had a PE. So the first thing that I would do is I would go on my MD Calc app and work out what his well score for PE is. So we can see that he's got signs and symptoms of a PE. Um, it's the most likely diagnosis. It's got a high heart rate and he's been immobilized for at least three days. So we know that he's really high risk for a PE. So, um, and he's got, you know, 40% chance of a PE. So my next step would be to prescribe this man treatment dose low molecular weight heparin. And it depends on your trust, which one you'd give. At the Royal, we give an oxaparin. So I prescribe him um, the treatment dose noxparin. I'd request a CTPA, and this only needs to happen overnight if there's evidence on the ECG of right heart strain. I would also request a Doppler ultrasound of the right leg because he had the soil and erythematous right leg. It's important to rule out a DVT as well. And I would optimize analgesia. And if you're unsure about any of these steps or you're not quite sure about the diagnosis, I'd contact the medical SHO on call. Okay. So the summary for this case is that all patients entering a hospital should have a VT assessment when they come through the door. And most patients in hospital are given prophylactic dose, low molecular weight heparin. So the only reasons why somebody wouldn't really have low molecular weight heparin are if they've had an acute stroke or if they've had a bleed on their brain. And there are some other, other reasons, but most patients have um, prophylactic dose, low molecular weight heparin when they come through the door. And this you know, hopes to prevent PE, but it does happen, especially in surgical patients. So it's really important if someone develops chest pain and they've recently had surgery or they've recently been in, in bed for a long time, it's really important to think PE. Okay, so on to the next case. So Betty Smith is a 75 year old lady who was admitted to hospital for treatment of a cap. Her past medical history is AF and she's on warfarin. She had an MI three months ago, 
She's got congestive cardiac failure, type 2 diabetes and COPD. And you've been bleeped by the nurses to prescribe her daily warfarin. So this happens all the time um, when I'm on call. And I just thought I'd talk you through it because it's something that is very intuitive to prescribe, but it just sort of requires somebody to talk you through how, how to do it. So onto the next slide. So this is a warfarin chart, um, pretty much the same in all hospitals. Um, so you've just got on here, um, basically, you know, patient details at the top, height, weight, um, and then you go through warfarin on admission. So um, the dose that they're on, and usually um, it will say they're on two milligrams on a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and three milligrams on a, on a, um, a Saturday and a Sunday. And as long as their warfarin dose is, and as long as their target INR is in their target range, you're okay to give them what they usually have. Um, so it will say the indication for their warfarin and the target INR. Um, so as long as their target INR is within that range, you can give them what they usually have on that day. But if it falls outside of the range, then if it's high, reduce the dose by sort of a milligram roughly, um, or if it's low, increase the dose. Um, but if there's a major discrepancy, again, I'd talk to my SHO, especially if I was sort of, I hadn't done it before. Um, so this is an example chart and um, you'll get this in sort of most hospitals. It's usually a paper chart and they don't tend to prescribe it um, on the electronic medical records. Um, but this is something that happens all the time. So be prepared for this on your own calls. So the next thing I wanted to just talk through is um, that many patients that you'll see in the hospital um, will go into AF and it can be new. And in these patients, it's important to talk to a cardiologist about whether or not you need to anticoagulate them. So I'm sure that you all know this already. Um, but again, the MD calc comes very handy here. So what I would do is if I'm if I've got a patient who's a new AF and I'm not quite sure where whether or not I need to anticoagulate them, I'd calculate their CHADS VASC score, um, which includes all of these risk factors. So I've calculated it here for Betty. Um, and then I'd also calculate a has blood score. And then I'd make a referral to cardiology and just say, this is the CHADS VASC score, this is the has blood score. Um, do I need to anticoagulate them? And, you know, most of the time they'll, they'll say yes. Um, but it's just about, you know, weighing up the risk of stroke versus the risk of a bleed so it's really important and this is another great use for your md calc app just you know put in the details and you can you can do that very very easily so um the next slide so i've got um a bit on doax so this isn't something that you do on your on call but it's just important to know so uh, the main DOAX are Redoxaban, Apixaban and Dabigatran. So in patients with new AF, we like to start them on a DOAC if we possibly can, because it's so much easier than starting a patient on warfarin. They don't need to be monitored as regularly. They don't need the weekly INR checks and it's a fixed dose and the dose doesn't change. The, but the main drawbacks of using the DOAX are that they can't be used in dialysis patients or severe renal failure patients. Um, and they're also very difficult to reverse. So if someone's going to be having a major surgery, sometimes it's actually better to have them on um, a different form of anticoagulation prior to their surgery. Um, with warfarin, you can re reverse it with vitamin K and with um, treatment dose noxparin, it's very easy to just emit a dose, but with the DOAX, it's actually very hard. So um, in summary, DOAX are great in certain patients um, and it's good, you know, it's really great to use it in AF, but there are some some drawbacks from using them. Okay, so if anyone's got any questions at any point, feel free to put them in the chat um, and I'll move on to case three. So 45 year old Bob Smith works as a mechanic and has broken his finger whilst repairing a car. So we're moving on now to analgesia. So Bob Smith pre presents to you in your GP practice for analgesia and a sick note and his past medical history is asthma. He's been taking one gram of paracetamol four times a day for finger pain um, and has come to you today because he's looking for more analgesia. So this was actually a case that I had in my fourth year OSCE. And although it looks very straightforward, it tripped a lot of people. Um, the main thing that you have to be aware of is that this, is, this patient is asthmatic. So going on to the analgesic ladder, 
So the patient's already on paracetamol. So the question is, what do you add to, you know, go up the pain ladder? And normally you would add in an NSAID, um, like ibuprofen. However, because this patient's asthmatic, NSAIDs are absolutely contraindicated. And this was something that really confused people in our final year, in our fourth year OSCEs. So um, it's really important. So if someone's um, asthmatic, don't give them NSAIDs. So the next step, you'd move on to the next step, which would be to give them a weak opioid like codeine or cocodamol. So you might swap out the paracetamol for cocodamol. Um, and this is important in hospital as well. So patients who are in some pain, you, you might give them paracetamol as a regular um, and then codeine or cocodamol. But it's really important that if you're giving them codeine, be aware of, especially in the elderly, of their bowels and give them a laxative. And then the next step is to give a strong opioid. So post-surgical patients um, can have morphine um, alongside regular paracetamol. Um, and, you know, you'll see a lot of patients in hospital who are on strong opioids as well. So my next case, continuing on the analgesic theme, um, is a patient that you're likely to see on call. So Simon Smith is an 87 year old man who's been admitted for baloney amputation due to critical limb ischemia. And he's on morphine, 20 milligrams long acting and 10 milligrams every four hours PRN. His oral intake has been poor during his mission. He's a type two diabetic with high blood pressure and high cholesterol and you've been called to see him because he's become unresponsive. His GCS is 13, he's got pinpoint pupils and his respiratory rate is, is five. His bloods are all normal except for he's got a new AKI stage three. So the things that should be going through your mind at this point are that he's on quite a lot of morphine um, and he's been using it regularly and he is on a lot of morphine and he's now unresponsive. So the pinpoint pupil should be quite a good clue as to the fact that he may have had an opioid toxicity and the low respiratory rate as well. And the thing I wanted to point out from the bloods, so an AKI um, can actually push people into opioid toxicity. So it's really important that even though Simon might have been going on absolutely fine on this dose of morphine um, for a while, the new AKI can mean that the morphine can accumulate. And even though that might have been absolutely fine for him yesterday, if he's had a new AKI, then that might suddenly be too much and he might, it might push him into opioid toxicity. So the, high, the important point to note here is that patients who have opioid toxicity um, be aware that they may have had an AKI. Um, so that was the key point here. And I got called to see a patient on one of my own calls who had become unresponsive with a low GCS um, and I was really worried about them. We weren't really sure what was going on um, and he hadn't had that much opioid. But the issue was his family had been bringing in water bottles full of Oromorph. So you have to be really careful in patients, um, you know, to find out exactly how much opioid they've had. And it can be really tricky. But the clues here are low respiratory rate, pinpoint pupils and the AKI as well. So... The plan for this patient, so do an A to E assessment, um, ensure that the airway is always protected. And if you've got any concerns, contact your seniors or contact the medical emergency team, because if the patient loses their airway, they're in trouble. And it, it would be good to get anesthetics involved early. So ensure they've got robust IV access because you need to give 400 micrograms of naloxone stat and you can repeat it as necessary. Um, so. The thing about naloxone is that it has a very short half-life. So um, morphine has a long half-life and naloxone has a short half-life. So you have to repeat it because otherwise its effect will wear off and they'll go back into a toxicity quite quickly. Um, and just keep assessing their A2E assessment um, to make sure that they're not losing their airway. So the summary from the analgesic section is avoid NSAIDs in patients with asthma, heart failure or renal failure. Be aware of the WHO analgesic pain ladder and don't move up steps, don't jump steps and try to sort of move sequentially um, through the steps. 
Um, be aware of the types of pain um, that you're treating. So if the patient has neuropathic pain, you might want to give them something like progabalin. Um, if they've got MSK pain, it might be good to give an NSAID provided that they don't have asthma, heart failure or renal failure. Be aware of the renal function, especially in patients with opioid toxicity. And another thing which is quite important is that oxycodone can be a better alternative to morphine in patients with poor renal function. Um, so you often find that patients with low EGFR have oxycodone prescribed rather than morphine. And if you're ever unsure about the amount of analgesia someone's on, or if they're asking for more and they seem to have what you think is the maximum amount they can have, talk to the pain team. Um, most hospitals have a very good pain team who can come around and have a look at each case and talk to the patients and work out sort of are they on the correct pain relief um, for them? So that would be what I would recommend. Okay. So on to the next case. So we're now moving on to insulin. Um, so Gary Smith is a 47 year old gentleman who presents to ED with severe abdominal pain, confusion and dizziness. He's a type one diabetic and he's on Lantus 24 units nightly. So that's this long acting insulin. And then he's on Humulin, 10 units, three times a day, which he takes with his meals. So that's his short acting insulin. So when you go to see him, his breath smells like nail varnish. Um, he's got a low blood pressure and he's tachycardic, but otherwise his obs are okay. You check his capillary ketones and they're plus plus plus. And on his ABG, um, he's acidotic and he's got a, a low bicarb. So fluids have been prescribed. So how would you, how would you describe this patient? Um, what, what do you think is going on with this gentleman? Um, if anybody can answer sort of through the chat or, or answer on the, and mute your mic. Okay. DKA. Perfect. Yes. That's exactly what I was going for here. So this patient's got diabetic ketoacidosis. So he's acidotic on his gas. He's um, got ketones and he's type one diabetic. So that's the, you know, the criteria. So the first step would be to prescribe fluids. And then once you prescribe fluids, you need to prescribe a VRII. Um, now this is something that I really had not a clue about at medical school. But since being F1, I've been asked to prescribe quite a few VRIs. So I thought it might be useful to just talk through what we mean by a VRII. So VRII stand, stands for variable rate insulin infusion or a sliding scale. And it basically is a scale, a sliding scale of insulin, which is adjusted by the nurses according to blood sugars. So it's very, very straightforward to prescribe. Um, and what you have to do is you just have to find the patient's potassium. You have to find out, um, yeah, all you have to find out is their potassium and that's pretty much it. And all you have to do is prescribe them as per the chart, act rapid in sodium chloride um, as per the rate above. And the nurses work out the rate based on their blood sugar. So all you have to do is sign and then sign to say whether they need potassium based on their potassium in their blood tests. So it's really, really straightforward to prescribe, but it's just very, it's very, um, it really is a tight control over the blood sugar and it tries to stop patients from going into hypo or hyper. Um, and in a DKA, this is very useful. The other um, time when this is useful is when patients are going to theatre. So if they're not eating or drinking, they stand a high risk of going hypo. So the way that you try to avoid that is put them on a sliding scale and then they have their, um, their blood sugar very regularly checked by the nurses and they, um, you know, that, that stops them from going hypo. So basically you've been, you know, you need to know potassium, prescribe it according to the chart. Um, they all pretty much look like this. The nurses set the rate according to the BM. And you, the other thing you need to know is that you have to stop their short acting insulin. So in this patient, you'd stop the Lantus, sorry, you you'd stop the Humulin and you keep going on the long acting insulin. So you keep going on the Lantus. 
So the plan for this patient with DKA is that you need to prescribe a VRII, you need to prescribe fluid replacement. Um, patients in DKA are very de fluid deplete, so you need to make sure that they have aggressive fluid resuscitation, including potassium replacement. And when the patient's stable, um, contact the diabetic specialist nurse. Um, so again, you know, like the pain team, diabetic specialist nurses are absolutely fantastic. They are brilliant at educating patients, um, optimizing insulin regimes, and they, they basically talk to the patient about why this happened, what they can do to prevent this happening again, um, and they're a really valuable resource. So I would, I would highly recommend you speak to the diabetes specialist nurses. Okay, so on this sort of similar theme of blood sugars, um, another case which you might um, come across on your on calls is Barry Smith, who's a 74 year old gentleman who has previously been admitted for treatment of an AKI. And the nurses call you because he's, he has collapsed and he is drowsy, clammy and confused. So this is very common. You'll often be called um, to patients who have fallen or collapsed. Um, he's a type 2 diabetic and he is hypertensive and he's got CKD. He takes metformin, a gram BD, um, and glycolazide for his diabetes. And when you come to see him, his GCS is 13 um, and his BM is 1.9. So he's, he's very, very hypo. So the reason why he's collapsed is because he's hypo. So in this kind of patient, you really need to think about IV glucose because he's drowsy. He's not going to be able to tolerate glucose orally. Um, you, you run the risk of aspiration and um, it's a dangerous level of hypoglycemia. Um, you can become neuroglycopenic with this kind of level of hypoglycemia. So it's really important to give IV glucose stat. So what you would give is you'd prescribe on your fluid chart, 50 mils of 20% glucose IV stat and ask the nurses to, you know, squeeze it through the cannula. And um, again, make sure this patient has IV access. Um, do your A to E assessment. And if there's any concern that the patient might be losing their airway, put out a MET call um, and get anaesthetics as well. Um, the nurses are very, very good at spotting hypos. And from my experience, they usually spot them and treat them without getting you involved. So, but sometimes if they're very hypo, they will call you. And this often happens, you know, well, it could happen at any time of day, but um, they'll typically treat the ones that are sort of less severe, and any that are sort of really severe, like less than two, they'll they'll call you. You you know you'll have to come and assess the patient and do an A to E. So um, recheck the BM after you've given the glucose. Um, patients can become hypo, you know, recurrent have a recurrent hypo. So just be aware that you know it could happen again. And again, put through your DSN referral. DSNs are really good at managing hypos and making sure that patients are on the right dose of insulin so they don't go hypo. So, um, yeah, so that's something that you'll commonly see on your on calls as well. Okay, so on to the next case. So Susie Smith is a 27 year old lady who presents with abdominal pain, um, which started unbelikely. So it started in central abdomen is now localized to the right iliac fossa. She's not got any past medical history and her obs are stable but she's complaining of nausea and vomiting and has requested an antiemetic. So the common antiemetics which we prescribe at the Royal are ondansetron and cyclozine, and they can be given IM, IV and orally. Um, so whenever a surgical patient comes through the emergency assessment unit, I would typically write them up for paracetamol, IV, oral um, and you know, um, other other routes. And I typically write them up for an antiemetic as well. And you can write them up for both um, as PRNs. So um, just so that the nurses don't bleep whoever's on call if the patient starts to get sick um, or starts to become nauseous, um, they can be already there. So any patient that you're admitting, you know, you do your V2, VTE assessment, um, you give them some paracetamol and you give them then than an antiemetic as well. So these two, I've I found from my experience, I would commonly give ondansetron or cyclozine. Um, they're they're mostly quite safe and well tolerated, um, and these are the most the two that I see most commonly prescribed on the wards. Um, Rose, we just have a quick question, if that's okay. Oh yeah, of course. Um, 
so someone's just said, would you hold the glycoside in um, the hypoglycemia too? Yes, brilliant question. So glycoside does cause a hypo. Metformin doesn't cause hypos, but glycoside can. So yes, I would hold it, but I would have, I would try and talk to the diabetes nurses if I can um, to try and sort of work out what would be best about restarting it um but yes absolutely as as if you know when when you see some of the low blood pressure on your calls you should hold their antihypertensives um the same would be true for for hypoglycemia um so yeah that was that's a really good question but i would probably take advice and i probably would talk to the diabetes team as well but thanks for the question um so contraindications for some of the um antiemetics. So metoclopramide is contraindicated in Parkinson's disease. Um, cyclozine, you shouldn't give in epilepsy or glaucoma. And ondansetron, um, you should use with caution in a long QT syndrome. So these are just some that I found in the BNF. Um, but mostly in most patients, ondansetron and cyclozine are absolutely fine. Um, and if you're called someone on call who's sick and the nurses have asked you to prescribe an antiemetic, I would just go for ondansetron or cyclozine. Um, they're, they're the two that we most commonly use at the Royal. Okay. So that's the end of my talk. So does anyone have any questions at all? Or is there anything that you, you find difficult about prescribing that you would like to ask me? And as you guys are maybe thinking about your questions, um, please fill out the feedback form. Um, if you want access to the slides, um, we'll be giving them out to anybody that sort of fills that in because we can get your email um, then. So, um, yeah, so I've, I have put it in the chat so I can send it in again. Um, but, yeah, please take a minute out just to do that. And especially if you want the slides. Um, so I think it looks like we do have a question. Can you see that, um, Rose? Yes, I'm, I can see side. it. Yes. I actually, to be honest... I, continuous rate, I'm not too sure if the, hmm, I'm actually not too sure of the answer to that question, you know, um, from my, from what I understand, we give a, a VRII, um, I'm not too sure what the continuous rate insulin is, but I will talk to the pharmacist on our ward and try and get back to you, I, I can get back to you some and, yeah, absolutely. I can like post it in uh, on the Facebook page or something, you know. Yeah, no, definitely. That, that would be great. I'm actually, I'm actually not too sure of the answer to that question. Um, VRI, oh yeah, so VRII, so you normally prescribe it on a separate form. So you have your fluids form and um, would you prescribe fluids on the other one separately? So yes, so you normally have your fluids form, which is in, in the Royal, we have a blue form. Um, you have a blue form for fluids and then you have a VRII form, which is actually a different form. Um, so we typically give a VRII um, in patients who go to sort of theatre and, you know, patients who have, you know, difficulty, have difficulty controlling their blood sugars. Um, so that's a different form altogether. Um, but yeah, the Royal, we have the two different prescription forms and they're separate from Jack. Um, sorry, Jack's our online prescribing system at the Royal. Um, so there's a question on laxatives. So when you when you give opioids, so there's lots of different options for laxatives. Um, I tend to go for a combination of Macrogol and Senna. Um, you can give any laxatives, but, but that combination um, works quite well. It seems to work quite well for people. And there are lots of other options like lactulose. That's an osmotic... Um, laxative. Um, some people don't think it works so well. I talked to a geriatrician today about lactulose and they didn't think it worked, but I would go macrogol first and you can give two, sh two sachets a day um, and senna once in the evening um, and they work, they work very well. Um, but, you know, in any patient who comes into hospital, most patients are constipated, so it's good to give patients um, laxatives um, anyway, like when you're prescribing paracetamol, when you're prescribing your antiemetics, if you've got an elderly patient who you suspect might be constipated, 
give them a laxative, it's not really going to do any harm unless they've come in with diarrhea, obviously, then you need to be a bit careful. Okay, dokie, I think we'll leave it there. Um, so thank you, Rose, for coming today. Um, I think everybody learnt um, a thing or two. So thank you so much. And again, everybody, just fill out the form, the feedback form. Um, and I think Rose will really appreciate that if a lot of you could do that. And of course, if you want access to the slides. So, okay, great. And I'll stop the recording here then. Thanks very much. Um,